So welcome and good morning, everyone. My name is Magnus Melander, and I'm a co-founder and evangelist at Things in Stockholm. Uh, we spent eight years trying to figure out how to successfully find business opportunities between large companies and tech companies within the deep tech area, industry, infrastructure, utilities, and mobility. And during those years and many years before, I got to know a lot of very, very good entrepreneurs. And I've invited a, a couple of them here to discuss scaling uh, today in this bigger summit. And if you can, uh, uh, please, the audience, if you don't have your cameras on, that would be great because it's going to be quite difficult to follow for me otherwise. I have to look <laughs> the speakers in their eyes to see if they're ready. Okay, and we, we, we will start with a very brief uh, introduction uh, by each of the speakers. And then we will have a discussion on specifically based on cases. And we, will, we have already agreed that we will talk about scaling through customers, uh, scaling through partners and licensing, and scaling internationally. That's the three topics we will address today. So let's start from uh, my left. Uh, Jan Oke, brief introduction, please. Yes, Jan Lindquist, uh, co-founder of uh, VSI. Uh, we are a tech house that supports other companies to realize their visions with regards to products and systems, uh, preferably the ones that contains physical hardware that you can uh, touch and uh, almost always with a small piece of connectivity uh, within. We've been doing this for about 20 years. Uh, we had uh, exit number one uh, back in 2016 and uh, the last exit uh, two years ago when we joined uh, Sigma Connectivity, which is part of Don Olofsson's uh, great big uh, Danir family. Great, thank you. Yeah, so you are, you are a scale up yourself and you help companies scale. So you're a perfect member of this little discussion. So John, please introduce yourself. Don Dicker is my name. I'm the CEO and founder of Flower. Um, and we, we're building a software-based platform called Power Refinery, where we connect to various types of consumption, power consumption, consuming, uh, power producing, or energy storing units. And then we can control the, their consumption and production. Uh, and in order to reduce volatility in the power system, to provide different type of ancillary services back to the power networks, uh, and then also optimize energy costs for our users. Perfect. Thank you, John. Uh, good to have you here. Now, Bjorn, you are next on my screen. Uh, thank you, Magnus. I'm Bjorn Lindblom. I'm the co-founder and chairman of Lovely. Uh, and Lovely have developed uh, and engineered a patented platform for the next generation of urban, urban uh, electric vehicles, which are just about to be launched in a couple of weeks from now. So, uh, our solution is is have USPs in in the in the way of uh, uh, class leading safety, extremely energy efficient vehicles, which saves up to eighty percent of uh, the energy usage, both in production and over a life cycle, uh, and it will scale globally. Our ambition is to produce millions of vehicles both through licensing and uh, local micro factories uh, in the big, big cities over the world. Thank Great. You. Yeah, Bjorn, you really can contribute with a lot because not only have you done this for 50 years, so you know how, how this takes time and it's challenging to scale, but uh, you know that, but you also helped a lot of other companies to scale personally. So, so you're also great. Now our last speakers uh, among the four here uh, are Carlos all the way uh, in, in Kyoto, I guess you're in Kyoto, well, in Japan at least. I'm in Kyoto, yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Carlos Cordova and I am a member of Hackers Global Sales Team. Uh, Hackers is a Japanese company that provides artificial intelligence solutions through image and time series data analysis, which can have uh, plenty of applications such as uh, visual inspections and predictive maintenance for industry and manufacturing and even uh, drug discovery and uh, diagnosis for the medical sector. Uh, so right now, Hackers is in an expansion phase like for overseas. And thank you for the invite and nice to meet you. Great, yeah, yeah. well, as you probably know, or maybe know things, we have members around the world. So uh, from Japan to US and Hackers is a great example of a member of ours. 
I, I have just another comment. So uh, I'm great to see a lot of people joining us. And if you, you feel free to raise questions or, or, or raise your, your issues or comments if you like, but I would like you to raise your hand digitally if you, if you know how to do that so we can get a little bit organized. Uh, but feel free to do that. So let's start. So scaling a company, uh, that's, that's a very kind of wide, uh, that's a wide kind of uh, statement. And it's, I always get nervous when people who are not in companies talk about scaling companies because that happens all the time that you know you hear politicians and others who have no idea actually about how to scale a company uh, talk about that so I, I'm, I think it's great to start from from cases and real life experiences always so and 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 my my panel here brings a lot of that uh, together so i think we should start with a with a, a case uh, and i think we should start with uh, well why don't start with carlos from hackers, because you were recently involved in a case together with Hitachi Energy uh, in a challenge that we organized for them uh, globally. And can you just very briefly tell us what happened and what you did? Yeah, sure. Um, this um, challenge uh, was identified by uh, an opportunity through a through an open innovation uh, program and that required some uh, digital platform uh, development. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is not our main business, but we have specialists for this type of uh, architecture that we use for some other solutions. And the main thing here is that we saw a potential uh, application for AI, uh, including visual inspections in the next phase uh, for, for this type of project. And uh, that this same digital app that we were going to develop uh, for, for, the, for this challenge could be also useful for the information management. And we also offered uh, those capabilities to, to the client. So in the end, uh, Hackers was selected as, as the winner for that challenge. And we developed the digital platform that the client required to solve the problem. Uh, even though there was no AI involved uh, at, at the first stage or the, at, that, at that moment. Uh, but the key factor is that we uh, build trust and then the project manager helped us uh, with some new connections inside the corporation uh, in order to start other projects uh, actually with AI implementation. So that, that's how it really uh, scaled. Um, if you stop that, Carlos, I'll, I'll just give some background. So, so this, this, you know, this was the global product management of, of Hitachi Energy, who actually came to us and said, they had, we have a problem. We're missing a product. Can you help us? So we said, yes, things. And we, we helped them create this kind of challenge. And we also called upon our friends uh, in the network who we thought we were able to actually not only get the job, but also deliver a product within about four months from, from start. And, and hackers was one of them uh, who we call on because we know what they're doing. And, and that's what happened. And you actually delivered this in time to them as well. So it was a very successful project. But I don't want to go too much into that specifically, but for what is, did this mean for you as a company when it comes to scaling your business internationally? Yes, most of the times, um... The, in our experience, these type of open innovation challenges and opportunities are the ones who have been the most um, um, successful way to scale uh, in, in a different market uh, because we can begin with a project uh, like a small POC or a pilot and build this kind of uh, trust with, with the client and then scale it to other type of uh, applications or solutions, which was the case of, of this uh, particular client. So we started with something that was not for AI, but then um, as, as we began to build this trust over the different departments, uh, we are now having several uh, projects in different types of uh, applications with artificial intelligence for, for, for this type of uh, customers. Yeah, yeah, I, th I really think it's great. Uh, and, and, and guys, if you have any comments, questions, so just let us know. I think this is a spectacular, good way to grow. And I know a lot of the 
old entrepreneurs in Sweden, like, uh, you know, people like Hugia, and you know, remember those old nice brands. They basically all uh, um, expanded internationally through customers uh, and customer deals. So I think this is a very interesting thing to talk about. And this is probably an area where we should uh, together try to focus more and also to, to, to have more of the corporates to, to, to kind of learn how to play these tools, so to speak. Because I know for sure, Bjorn. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I take the, you know, my old famous example of starting with a PowerPoint together with Telefonica ending up with winning the biggest uh, IoT uh, deal in the world at that time in 2014 or whatever it was, 1.5 billion pounds uh, total value. And that was actually driving the whole transformation of both the company Conode and the solution we only had on, on PowerPoint slides at, at the point of sale, sort of. So having a, a demanding customer on the other side and having sort of a, a high-end innovative uh, look at the corporation. So how can we do this together uh, is an excellent recipe for success, I would say. Yeah, no, okay. And I think John Walker had a number of similar. Yeah, I think, you know, okay. I'm thinking about, I think you developed a, a, a network solution to India once, didn't you? That might be a yeah, good example. I was actually thinking of that one, uh, and and uh, and how how is that uh, driving? The, I think that that being able to work uh, like we did through things, working on a global market and uh, addressing these these uh, being in the front line of technology actually enabled that, uh, okay. and that made us then uh, get this this large project that uh, it, despite. The, the larger organizations in Sweden, they said, don't touch this because this is a, this is a, a crazy Indian. Uh, but, but that was actually something that attracted us, being able to, to work with a different culture uh, in a different uh, way in terms of, of, of business. But that actually was uh, one of the major things that took us through the telecom crisis. All the other companies, they were scaling down and we were actually scaling up because we had this two year project with uh, this company in India. Uh, and, and I'm being curious and then being in the, the front line of tech that gives you those opportunities uh, and being a bit um, not Swedish, I would say, uh, be a bit aggressive in that uh, arena. Uh, that's also a way to take you further. And looking now at the, the bigger organization that, that I'm in and being in the, in the line of service, since we are a service company, uh, we can also build these hubs around certain parts of technology. We, we provide Android teams to global organizations because that's a, a, it, it's a hard skill to build uh, on your own. And we have a couple of teams. So, so uh, that's something that we deliver all over the world to, to these big tech brands. I think that there are a lot of good examples of this topic and so forth. And I think we are, at least in, in the panel, we all know that this kind of works. I think the most important comment to that would be that it's not that easy. It's not that you just go to slush and you run into customers and then you're done. So our experience of things is the opposite. It's all about processes and quality and selection and focus. It's not about large, huge events and programs like that. That's more like entertainment. It's great to do, it's nice, you meet nice people. But I always tell the, the smaller companies, if you go to Slush and want to meet, let's say Scania or Volvo or somebody, you know, you will probably meet them, but you will meet the wrong person anyway. So it's, it, I think it's a, there's a lot of kind of dead ends on that road, but it's a great way to expand internationally. So why don't and we just go one, to one comment to that, Magnus? Yeah. And it, it, and it's not the it's not the one time thing. When you've done slash five times or ten times, then it happens. Like we've done Barcelona thirty times, then then you get things more or less for free as well. I would argue with you that that's two different <laughs> events. I know what you mean, but you know the problem is that the right guys are not at slash at all, and now the right guys might be at my world congress i think that's my experience anyway let's jump on to the next sorry 
<laughs> what is is somebody want to say something it's muted now yeah. okay uh, let's jump on to the next topic now so so now we've covered a bit about how to expand internationally uh, with customers so what about working with customers uh, and and develop and so forth and scale as such uh, and I think John your story is 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 quite amazing so just to introduce to we are helping for the third year now things we're helping uh, Alea View and Goodell to run something they call Startup for Climate, uh, which is a very good type of challenge, we think, because it's, it's all about finding companies who they believe uh, can speed up or accelerate the transformation, the, the uh, energy transformation, and virtually give them some <laughs> practically give them some money to, to, to accelerate. So it's a very nice, uh, nice program. And we have done that for three years. The, the, the next uh, uh, final is on in, two, in one week, I think, or two weeks. Last year, we had two winners, and one of them was Krafthem, which then became Flowers. So that's, uh, and John did a spectacular presentation there. The jury, I was in the jury, so I know, I could see their eyes. They were really uh, amazed. And, and you can take it from there. What, what happened to you, except that you got a little bit richer in, in, in craft and flower? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I typically say that must be the best presentation I've ever held because all of the jury members reached out for different reasons afterwards, which was uh, incredible. Uh, but uh, we, 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 we partnered up with, uh, basically, or Liv and I, uh, we had a discussion regarding a uh, partnership uh, where we would supply the technology which also turned into a more strategic partnership uh, with them uh, becoming a minority shareholder in us as well. And together uh, we, we've laid sort of the foundation so, uh, to accelerate uh, energy storage, especially in, in Sweden. So we had, uh, we had them joining us as investors, but also in the share and as basically our biggest customer now as well. And following that, uh, we, 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 for about, I think, 12 months ago, we were five people at, at that main craft. And today, we were more than 25 people. So it's, uh, I, I'm not sure I'm one of the one in the panels that uh, can look back and say that I have experience in scaling up. Uh, I'm sort of building it currently, I think, if I'm <laughs> being completely transparent. But there's uh, a lot to come in place also when you go into these sort of partnerships. Uh, that it's because, uh, of course, Eleva has expectations on us, we have expectations on them, and we need to manage it all uh, simultaneously, which comes with a lot of staffing up as well. And that, that's a big part of my job in scaling up is building a team that can sort of uh, core to all, all the needs that arise. But I would also put emphasis on what you say, Magnus. It's not what I found from, from, from Flower's perspective is that it's all always about finding the right people on the other side. So uh, me and Christopher, who is at Elevio, uh, is the head of business development there. We had a, a, a lot of discussions before even discussing um, us becoming a supplier. And then, uh, then also in the discussion where they eventually became a shareholder as well. But it's about finding that key a partner and that you spend a lot of time with and building that trust over uh, a lot of time and dedicating a lot of time and energy into that uh, relationship in a sense um, because you, you can't do you perhaps you could do two of these deals simultaneously that, but that's might be a bit ambitious but i think you can't do five so if you're you, you need to focus and you need to believe that you can't uh, an internal ambassador on the other side with both the the interest, motivation, and resources to drive the project through uh, on on the big side uh, with large customers, and that's I've met a lot of also from the beginning of our journey a lot of uh, stakeholders on our, in other companies that has had both the interest and motivation, but not perhaps the resources to internally drive change within that company, and it's it, you really need to have all three to make something happen. Otherwise, you're going to sit in long processes that end up in nothing. Everyone's excited, but it would end up in nothing. So you need to be selective. And that's pretty tough. Also from the startup to scale-up perspective, because when 
looking back when we were three, four people, we were grasping at every sort of single straw that we found. Every potential customer we just latched on to and took a hold on. And, and that sort of reversed now to us being very selective with who we partner with because we, we have much more respect for our limited time and how much it times to build great partnerships. Uh, so that's a that's a part of scaling up as well. I think it's, it's becoming more selective, extremely much more focused on the importance of great relationships. It's that's that certainly comes with growing up. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's great. I, 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 you, I, you sh I, we should mention here that that you know I think a lot of people have read about what what uh, Tesla is doing with with the batteries of the cars and they use them to cut peaks from energy companies as well. Well, that is exactly what Flower does, but they do it generically, not only on their own batteries. So this is a spectacular company, and it will grow like wildfire, I think, uh, onwards. So do we have any other uh, examples of, of uh, like that to share? I think Bjorn, if we, we, we also, there's an, there's an alternative to work with customers. Uh, but before we do that, my, maybe I should tell you that I, I, the single question I deal with when I talk to customers, uh, corporates, big companies uh, all over the world is always how to avoid theater. So, the innovation theater, I think, is the biggest risk whatsoever, whichever industry you're in. But for startups, it's huge, but it's even maybe user, huger for scale-ups. Because like John says, they can only focus on one or two or three things. And if one or two or three of those it becomes theater, that they waste their time and nothing happens, well, then they are dead. That's how easy it works. So, so I think when it comes to all those kind of programs and activities and so forth, you have to be very selective also when you're an early startup before you start to scale. And there's a wonderful book, Still Valid, called uh, Crossing the Cast by Jeffrey Moore. If you want to read something about it, he figured it out many, many years ago, and it's still very valid, I think. Bjorn, how are you uh, uh, going to conquer the globe with your car? Uh, I assume that it involves, and I know actually, it involves partnerships uh, because that's something not not the same as customers. It, it, it's something else. But can you explain a little bit about how you deal with that? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think we can all agree it, it's about daring to think big. I mean, that's a hard thing when, when you're small. I totally agree with John to, to focus your efforts. Uh, but in our plan, we plan to first launch uh, an extremely good, cost-efficient, uh, sort of well-priced product on the market uh, targeted towards the consumer segment uh, to gain a lot of uh, interest globally uh, from media and from other players, sort of like, like what Tesla did once it happened in, in, in upon a time, but our ambition is not to build millions of cars on our own. Our ambition is to scale uh, by handing our technology to other brands and players around the world who scale up micro factories on their own. And the only reason for that is that we, we see that will create the biggest impact. We can save 80% energy and you know, be extremely environmental friendly if we can reach our targets in producing 3 million vehicles in five years. But we can't probably not do that by ourselves. And I, I see a number of different potential partners, which sort of, I, I used to say IKEA is one of my favorite sort of thought customers. If IKEA would buy into the lovely story and build a world-class electric EV and launch that in 30 markets with sort of 30 to 100 micro factories all over the world, it would really scale. And they, they have all the bits and pieces uh, in place to do that incredibly fast. But uh, it's, it's uh, sort of, a, if you, you being from, uh, the region Magnus knows that you know it's it's hard to make a deal like that, but you need to have a few uh, potential brands like that, and you also need to work with people in the industry. And we rather see leading two wheel companies in India uh, who are market dominant dominance in their field, 
who wants to go to four wheel light turbine vehicles to expand their offering on the market. Uh, so we have a well thought out process and target list on the customers we want to reach globally, but we will drive it through launching extremely good, lovely products under our own brands. I think that's that a lot makes of good sense. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of good points. Uh, yeah. but I think that there is a huge difference uh, between just thinking about partners and going to somebody to ask if they're going to be a partner or having figured out how the marriage should work like <clears throat> already before. So, so I think that if you're going to do huge partnerships or massive partnerships or very impactful licensing or something like that, you just have to have it part of your overall strategy and plan. And it has to be very, very well thought out before you actually start to talk to people. But uh, the problem is that the larger guys, they, they have the, the appetite and they have the, 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 the strength in the mouth to eat you live rapidly you know so i think it, that's the the that's one of the things that makes your story so great uh beyond with love it you know, i'll, I'll okay, tell you how it went a couple of years from now sorry <laughs> yeah <laughs> we know you know okay i know that you work a lot with parties without parties you were nothing i think you said to me once uh but but your parties are something else than 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 uh, maybe sales partners it's 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 more like um uh, development partners or you know, providers of technology or explain that a little bit please yeah well i mean we try to build ecosystems uh, around uh, the application that that our customer typically uh, resides in uh, and prior to being part of sigma uh, we had areas uh, like cloud and uh, maybe ux and the industrial design that wasn't really compatible with the core offerings that we had because we are we are coming from an engineering background engineers are based on rules uh, and needs while id and uh, design that's more of a artistic uh, personality so so we have built uh, a lot of uh, very long lasting and very fruitful partnerships with those kinds of companies in the region uh, whereas we come to them with the clients and they come to us with clients. Uh, so, um, and it's, of course, uh, it's probably out of 10 such partnerships, there are two of them that are really good and fruitful, but you have to test your way forward. And uh, like, like you also said, John, spend time together and realize uh, who, who, who are the, the doers and who are the talkers and uh, get business going. Uh, into that deal flow. Uh... So it's it's a lot about relationships, and uh, and this is kind of similar as in Bjorn's case. But you know, you, whatever you need to bring with you that you don't have, you know, you just have to find a partner or somebody, a friend to help you with. So so I think that's a very important part of this as well. In many in many discussions, partnerships and customership is 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 mixed up as one. I think that's dangerous actually. So Carlos, you have done business across the globe, basically from 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 Japan, and and uh, well, you know, and the cultural differences and so forth between countries in Japan are are big or bigger, it depends on where you go. Uh, how how would you kind of describe Europe or maybe Sweden compared to uh, U.S. and Asia and Japanese markets? So is it very different or difficult or is it easier or what's your view? scaling in Europe or scaling in Sweden? Um, in, in our um, previous experiences, we somehow try to um, identify some um, problems or situations that the industry in, ja in Japan is facing. And we try to like find out if other markets have the same uh, kind of challenge or situation. And, and most of the times I would say that it's not that different. I mean, if, if there's like a specific issue in, <clears throat> in any kind of industry, most of the times it can be replicated, uh, I mean, outside Japan. Uh, so we have been um, having uh, deployments uh, over Sweden, Germany, uh, Singapore as well, the US, and we're about to start uh, also a project in, in Morocco 
as well. But <clears throat> I, I would say that there is not such a huge difference in in terms of uh, the the needs or the problematic that and an a specific industry can be faced um, in in terms of building this kind of uh, business relationship with with the actual people. Um, I, I would say like most of the times Europe uh, can be more open and the European uh, uh, business people try to be more like um, more open-minded maybe I, I would say um, and, and we have found like this this kind of um, people that have helped us before to scale up the um, this type of solution into other phases or, or other uh, departments in the same kind of uh, corporation. So um, I, I would say that in, in Europe, we have found more help in this kind. And this is how we lost two colors. Oops. Sorry. No, you have to repeat the last sentence. We did, we lost your sound. Ah, oh, sorry. So, so uh, Western Europe is nowadays our biggest market, uh, and most of the deployments that have been uh, done in Sweden and also Germany, it's because of these kind of relationships that we already talked about before, uh, where we have found like a, a specific um, a, a key people that can help us to. Uh, upscale the solution into the same corporation, like in other departments, or um, try other AI applications for different use cases. Great. Yeah, I mean, you should. A, a lot of us, I guess, have been doing business in other countries, and, and we know that is difficult wherever you go, actually. It's hard in Sweden alone if you're Swedish, but you know, it's difficult to go to other countries because of the relationships and, and the legal reasons and all of that. There's a lot of issues. Uh, but but uh, things we really believe in in the focus as I told you so so we have been focusing a lot on Japan and Germany specifically over the years and, and normally you know in Sweden Innovation Days I think uh, we have been managing relationship with Japan and Germany for Sweden Innovation Days as well so I think again that pays off you know the more people you get to know uh, in a in a by, because all business relationships are, are bilateral you know it's it's two parts. Uh, the easier it has to continue. I think Hackers is a great example of that, uh, actually. Any other views? I mean, Bjorn, you, you, I know you have you have a lot of relationships in, in like India, and I know that for many, many years. And I, 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 I guess it's not like randomly that you end up doing more business in India every time you change your job. So I guess you, you're in a similar token here. Yeah, I, I, India is a, a really complex market. But I, I really love India, as you know, and they always think big. I mean, whoever you talk to there uh, talks about scaling and, and find ways to scale different solutions. So there is a strong ambition. It is one of the biggest markets in the world. It's uh, to a big extent well educated, and there is a lot of need for new transformational products and solutions uh in india as a country so and and nowadays there's pretty good financing uh, capabilities as well in india so i think as john Oki tested it in the past as well and i one of my previous companies is is the market leader in india nowadays uh, i think you should dare to try india and uh, so sort of try to work with india and there are mm -hmm. a number of different good partnership models around and, and organizations working with Swedish India, uh, sort of business making and other stuff around that. Yeah, but that's kind of the point. Don't, don't, think big, but don't go there alone, you know? <laughs> or no, the it, bread. it takes time it's and difficult. costs money. So you need, you need to really plan for it. And every, anyone that wants to step into India and, and wants to discuss it, give me a call in separate. Um, I'm more than happy to discuss that. Yeah, I, I always tell people that I mean, I've been engaged in quite many scale up stories and, and I, specifically when it comes to internationalization, because 
I think they have this very simple idea that if I've, I've worked a lot abroad and I created and maintained and developed a lot of very good relationship with people. So it's much better to know a, a person you trust uh, in another country who is recently well positioned in the market, because that person will help you find the right guys to work to than trying to find the right guys to work to because they change all the time. You know, you just have to be local to figure out where to go and so forth. So, so that's a, a, a little, a little uh, advice from me that, that try to find a person you actually trust, primarily trust, you know, uh, and, and go through them to find the right ways to go. We also have bodies in, 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 in Sweden and other countries who can help you. Uh, I haven't worked with a lot of those, so I don't have any specific. Do you have any example of that among you who have worked with uh, some of the, the public programs we run, if, how that works? Bjorn, maybe you have them and you work with them in India. I don't know. No, actually not. We worked with SIBC, which is sort of more of a private in initiative. Uh, but, you know, Business Sweden is there, of course, and you meet them and, and other, other players. But we've been uh, quite cost efficient in our, our ambitions over the years. So it's, it's you need to be very... So you need to think about where you put your money when stepping into a new country. I, I don't think you can make it only with consultants. I mean, you need to have people on the ground you trust, as you say, minus. And you need to go there yourself. Uh, probably the best advice is to just plan and go and join sort of a, a, a India or UK session where you meet people on the ground and start meeting customers. I think whatever market you you're going to. So let's spend the last part of this discussion on on uh, the other part of things. So so there's there's a lot of initiatives uh, in Sweden and other countries about helping people to do things, helping companies to scale, helping companies to do this and that. So I like the other approach, asking people what they actually need. Uh, so what what would you guys say you would have be very happy if you got when it came to your scaling that you didn't get or didn't find when it comes to your scaling plans and, and ambitions and so forth? Or everything was there, so you don't, you know, you had everything you wanted. It delivered incredibly we, well. We, we can't say business plan and we can't say money. <laughs> so that's... Uh... I think that's always, uh, or not business plan, but business models. I yeah. think business models and, and sort of find the right model to scale uh, and uh, good long-term investors is always uh, a sort of a hard one. I don't know what John says. You, you sort of stepped a bit ahead in that, in that part. Yeah, maybe I, I got my... My, my long-term money before I realized I did it too bad. Uh, so for me, for me, I, I would say where we are right now, it's, the, I mean, my everyday is organization and hiring and growing. And uh, it's all extremely new to me. So, I mean, being more prepared in how to scale an organization. I mean, I've, I've gone to university, I've read organization courses, a few of them actually, but uh, more like practical reality in what happens when you grow the team because there's a lot of dynamics that change and having we've got that just now a few days ago uh, help with that and that uh, that's I, I would going back i would have taken that help earlier on if i could uh, because uh, yeah. all those dynamics it's it's impossible to imagine in your head what's going to happen uh, even I mean the, the people we get help from now, they don't I mean they're very open with like we don't know what's gonna happen. The organization is uh, an organic beast that needs to be monitored and maintained in all different aspects, but it, 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 it's a skill set in itself to manage and grow. So help with organization. Uh, I think I think one one thing uh, on that subject, uh, organization uh you always hear about diversity and uh, that it works, but uh, it actually, it works a lot. Uh, and it's, it made us go from a, a bunch of uh, engineering happy dudes to become, you know, the feeling when you have a real company. 
we went from uh, 18 dudes to now uh, 45 employed uh, a, a real company we have about 30 percent girls now and we are we are really adding a lot of uh, female character to the company uh, also diversity in terms of uh, nationalities uh, and it's really it makes a big difference uh, it probably has a bigger impact in the uh, engineering uh, savvy organization uh, but then also, I mean, to, to diversify uh, yourself. I mean, I, I since I'm on top of sales, I, I sell in a certain way. I hired a, a, a second sales guy in the company who's the opposite of my personality, who's a bulldog. And it, I mean, it made dramatic changes to, to uh, the success we had in sales. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think that, that's one of the things that has impacted us the most. Is, uh, it's diversity, actually. And I, I wouldn't, I, I didn't see that coming. It's nicer to visit you these days than Okia. I can, I can verify that. <laughs> we even have curtains. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's talk about something else. We, we talk about scaling up, but we have a lot of incredibly successful and, and, and great scale, scaled up companies already in this impact area in Sweden. You know, Cake and Einride and, and Polarium, and there's Candleline. You know, there, there's I think there's like 20 of those fairly already grown up companies, and it to me it's quite interesting because what kind of what can, they haven't, as far as I know, none of them really haven't really followed the 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 old kind of let's do a startup and then go through an incubator and then if that, they haven't done that. They, it's more like they come from somewhere else, which I call the new wave of innovation. Uh, which is the deep take wave of innovation, where you basically decide that we have enough technology to solve a problem, uh, which one would you want to solve? And then you work very broadly with partners and people and technologies and stuff to find the best solution to sort that out. So, and I think a lot of you, I mean, uh, that's kind of, John, that's, that's what you have done really, I guess. I, I'm not sure, but I, I don't think you have been in an incubation program or anything like that. You come from experience, from elsewhere uh, and start up. So my question is, do you have any, any because when, when companies have been as successful as let's say Einride and, and Northvolt and those, I mean, they are almost hard to, to get hold of because they are insanely busy to sell and build, build capabilities and build factories. And so we always talk about helping people to scale. And, and, and so what do kind of scaled up companies really need from others except money and 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 are there any i i have difficulties finding what we should do for them so to speak that that that's i'm probably blind but any views of that what 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 should we do that's a good question i mean we haven't gone that uh, the accelerator incubator track and it's uh, it's a lot for my part being a li little bit uh, reluctant to uh, get like you said minus the like general help because i think when you get general help that misses the target because what we do is we try to be extremely focused and and uh, time is really the limiting factor so if help can also of course then consume time so it needs to be very sort of to the point and then i think from my perspective it's more more uh, more of the mentorships bit and, and that, that I've sort of reached out to myself whenever I needed it. I've been quite open that I, I need help all the time. Um, but it's it's targeted uh, sort of needs uh, that I think for, for me is I, I need to identify them myself uh, and then I, then I need help with it. So so I guess in a sense that if I if I if I got the help, whatever I need, it would be to have that network more established because now it's it's sometimes me just reaching out to LinkedIn and seeing if I can buy some coffee and talk with them for for an hour. Uh, but yeah. to them, to, to exactly what I need. <laughs> That's yeah. I think. makes sense. Yeah, I, I always uh, compare with with people, you know. Uh, you, you, children and they grow up they go to school they go to you know and then they all of a sudden they turn to university maybe and then they might go to another country to do that but then they are kind of grown up 
And then everything changes because up until that first point, you have to be there and help and care and, you know, guide. And so, but then when people are adults, they, they can manage themselves and maybe they will ask for help and then you, they should get it. So I think the support system should be exactly like that for companies as well. It's great that we help people to figure out how to run a company and then we can, we can do those kind of things as part of education and very important. But when people have grown up, when companies are, have scaled up, it's, it's, it's more like to be ready to, to, to help them when they ask for it than providing programs. That's kind of my, exactly my point. I don't know if that's, if that's a good idea or not, but that's really how I see it, in, in how it works in reality, at least. I agree with that. Good. So we are at 10.30. I think this is supposed to last to 10.45, was it? Yeah. So we have yet another 15 minutes to discuss. Uh, do we have any, any interesting topics from the audience, maybe? Any questions? Any comments to what we talked about? Feel free to, uh, to jump in. Hello, I'm, I'm Per. Can you hear me? Yes, please yeah. present yourself. That's great. Good. No, Per Landquist, and uh, I'm actually heading a, a, to say a um, board member advisor network uh, international. And I think it's very interesting to hear what you have been discussing so far. And uh, I'm very humble, but, but one little piece when scaling up is of course, when you're going to a new market is to get the right network, to get this door opener, this guy with a little bit gray hair or female without gray hair, but but to, to enter a new market. And uh, I'm not gonna do any uh, advertising for, for the company I represent, but there are uh, tools and uh, we have 5,000 international advisors from 100 countries, you can go that way uh, to see if you find someone and a little bit going to what Bjorn said and uh, uh, we have advisors in India and whatever, but it, it's at least a complement to your own network and to maybe what Business Sweden and others can do. So, so there are other tools. That's just a little bit of a sm small remark, uh, which is very interesting, I think. Um, uh, I myself working as an advisor and board member as well, but, but in, in, in this, uh, sense I, I represent like a search company, light search company for, for this kind of uh, uh, resources. Well, I, I think you raise a very good point, not only exactly what you said, but also, I mean, in order to scale successfully, you just have to have a good board. You have to have a good governance. You have to have all the things in order to get the money in your company when you're going to scale and need more money. You also have to be have everything in order. You have to have a good board, good governance, good documentation. I think it's really important to think ahead uh, already when you start your company, how you structure your documentation and processes and all of that. So there's a lot of stuff you can get help with, uh, as you properly say. And th this is also a, a kind of diversity that you don't see a lot of in startups, the gray hair. Uh, uh, so in a lot of these young startups, they would really benefit from, from how, having more gray hair in the, uh, in the organization. Um, and more diversity agree? as you were into in, in your company. You know, it's, uh, and, I, and that's a hard nut to crack, I found. I mean, I, I have a quite good network on gray hair, uh, fantastic men with good connects. Uh, and I'm always looking for the same on the female side, but when it comes to investors and potential board members, um, also ask for that specifically in my network, but it doesn't pop up every day as, as sort of new potential leads. So I, I really agree with what mm -hmm. you said, Per, that there are a number of uh, sort of potential okay. ways to find connects in, in new countries. Yeah, and we have about 20% female, which is far too low, but it's, uh, that's one of my ambitions to grow the network with, with senior female representatives and, and other cultures as well. Yeah. Well, that we, by, if I can boast about things, we did that by design. We decided to be me and Linda when we started. So we have always been 50%, actually 51 to Linda, I guess. But but it's a very good it's a very good thing. It doesn't happen. It's not like changing from color, you know, non-colored envelopes to 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 uh, to non-colored to, to non-colored envelopes. This is something you have to build from scratch. Among 
5,000 other things. When I was an investor, I always got the question from journalists and others, what are the three or five most important things? And uh, I always said it's the wrong answer. It's the wrong question. There is about 15,000 ways to fail at, and it doesn't matter which of them you fail on, but you just have to sort out a way to work that you minimize the risk of ending there. Signing a wrong contract or making a poor recruitment or there are billions of ways to fail. Great, Pai. Any other questions or comments from the audience? No. I have to check. I got the message from the organizers. Um, oh, that we have to let in listeners in our some in our discussions. Yeah, we have done that already, so that's fine. Uh, but we don't have a lot of comments. Okay. Well, I have nothing more really on my on my uh, agenda, so we can talk about something else if you like, or add something to what we talked about already. So, Carlos, have you any any expansion plans specifically for Sweden, or are you happy with the way it is right now? Um, so right now we are planning to keep, keep on, uh, searching for this type of, um, open innovation challenges or, uh, business matching programs and, and events, uh, to identify potential customers also like the trade fairs, uh, where, where we can show our solutions uh, and get some exposure. For example, um, this, uh, this week is like the, the vision fair in Stuttgart right now. So we have a team also like in, in, in there right now, but those are like the three main things that um, somehow have, have made us like get some new customers overseas. And we believe that if there's like this right path, uh, we will keep like searching for this type of opportunities uh, overseas in, in Western Europe mainly, uh, which has has been our, our most successful uh, market yet. So yeah, try try to also um, replicate to to other parts of the world. But yeah, mainly this these are our main approaches right now. Great. Let's I I can raise uh, another topic before we since we have a little time left. Because I, I truly, as I mentioned before, I truly believe in the that we're entering into a new wave of innovation after the external innovation era of uh, Silicon Valley model type with VCs and you know IP coming from somewhere and 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 entrepreneurs starting companies. I think uh, I think we're going into what we call a deep tech uh, wave of innovation now, which means that you start from a problem and you build from from there across technologies, across disciplines, uh, people, teams, you build ecosystems behind and, and, and then you go. I mean, there's a lot of examples already like MNRR in the vaccine uh, technologies is a good example. Uh, Satellite X is a good example. I would even argue that uh, Northvolt and those kind of companies are also good examples of that. The problem we are facing with that is that if, if a lot of those are spun out of corporate or research, they might be five PhDs who work 10 years to build something great to save the planet in hydrogen production. They have maybe built a factory, to, a, a test factory to, to, to make sure that the, the whole thing works and they are ready to be spun out. They need probably 10 million euros to pre-seed money. And this is a completely new way of of building companies, spinning them out from universities, spinning them out from, from corporates, uh, or making people individuals themselves to gather a team to do this. I don't know if you agree with this, but this is very, very challenging. Uh, Sweden and Europe, we are not very good at spinning out uh, technologies. Uh, we don't have a great track record for that. Uh, Europe has not a great track record in, in uh, in uh, technology transfer, really, we do a lot of work, but but do you have any? Do you recognize this situation? Or, or and and like Bjorn, I guess you have been, you have been trying to sell a technology or something for for a lot of years, 
uh, to get it flying. But the problem is to invest a huge amount of money up front instead of a very small seed money. Uh, you have to know exactly that business and that technology and that industry. And how do we get to a point where we have investors who, who are willing to and ready to do that? Because today, like we have difficult, as soon as people work with hardware, uh, it's hard to find investors. They typically find that a little bit difficult. Uh, so I, that, this is what keeps me awake on the night. So maybe we, if you have any views or comments on that, that would be interesting to hear. We are a little bit out of our box now. <laughs> I know that. I, I, just w one take on that is I also think we see uh, new types of uh, investors. I mean, this, uh, this will take generations to, to build. And a uh, little bit, if you look at the companies you, that you mentioned, like uh, Polarium, Mexiger, Northvolt, these are like second generation entrepreneurs. They are doing their second spin. Uh, so I think we will probably see a few of the old time, old school investor guys going for these deep tech. Uh, but we will probably see some of the new uh, generation of, uh, of the entrepreneurs to go that way. Uh, I heard uh, Harald Mix recently, uh, and he said he is the guy behind, uh, or partially behind uh, Portuguese, the green steel company in Norfolk as well. But he said that, that, that which is applicable to us as well, that we are not in a literal sense, but a figurative sense that we don't need 200 billion, we need 200 billion. And that's a whole other sort of when you build infrastructure factories, it's you've left the VC world, but the VC world wants to be a part of it. So you need to really get your head, wrap your head around project financing, which most people coming as entrepreneurs don't really know because you need to involve debt finance, you need to involve customer offtakers, you need to, it's a, a lot more complex sort of financial engineering going into how you structure those big deals. And uh, that's something that we work a lot with as well because we, we're also uh, building infrastructure in a sense, uh, or like real infrastructure as well, not just software. And, those investors are really hard to find because basically you need pension money size stuff that's willing to take a large amount of risk uh, and but i think like uh, you know he said it's it, it's going to take a time to build that ecosystem but from the green sort of transition and the transition that we're in i mean the energy energy sector is not uh, afraid of taking and there's power refineries which is tens of billions of dollars single investments because they build that up over 100 years uh, and that needs to happen within five to ten years within the green space because it's the same scope of project we're talking about uh, which is uh, yeah it, it's going to be interesting to see how that develops and there's so many dimensions of this because as you all know i guess that that europe is like behind in in, in quite many technology areas and and all of those areas who are uh, transversal, as they call it, you know, those who are quite generically improving all industries, like AI, for instance, that's it. And ICT has been one of those. Uh, those technologies, if we're not, uh, you know, strong on those, we will lose out in basically any on all industries onwards because we are in the hands of others. So it is a quite huge problem. And the other thing is that all the major uh, all the major sustainability issues and, and crises we have to deal with require deep tech type solutions. To fit. We talk a lot about carbon catching and all those kind of things. It's 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 insanely complicated things to build, uh, and we just have to build them. <laughs> so that's why I'm a little nervous. Uh, despite my gray hair, I, I haven't seen this before. So so I think it's an important thing to work. With. And I think guys like you are the ones who are going to help us actually fix that. Um, so if we don't have any more comments or questions or anything, uh, I would just like to thank you uh, panelists and the speakers and attendees. I was asked to involve the, the, the attendees more, but I, I, it was difficult. <laughs> it was, I didn't get any too much responses, but that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed the little chat. And if anybody wants to talk to me or talk whatever, threat me or whatever afterwards, you can find me at things. Uh, and I'm more than happy to talk to people. 
So with that, uh, I will now jump down to the main room and I will be part of a panel where we're going to discuss this with others. Uh, but we shut down this room uh, basically now. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.